Welcome back to Horn Throwers. I'm joined by Klaus from Morgul Blade. Really happy to have you on. Hello. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. No worries. We were like, me and Liv are both, um, sadly Liv's ill, so she couldn't be here tonight. But like, um, we've really been loving the Heavy Metal Wraiths record. We've played uh, the, the a lot of the stuff off the prior album. Um, a lot of, because we do a three-hour radio show every week. Like a, oh, cool. Very cool. Underground, like, metal radio show. It's important. It doesn't really happen in America too much. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm because I, I know that like early days of like metal, you had like Eddie Trunk things like that, and like you know that in America it was like very much like kind of like college radio, kind of spread the word about yeah. like, metal and stuff like that. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely like factions of that. Uh, my friend Gary runs uh, uh, in Missouri. He runs a college like radio, like he gets like a three hour or two hour block every, every once a week or whatever. Um, but as far as like the bigger cities go, it really is becoming a more and more uh uncommon thing which is so it's cool to hear that you guys do that kind of stuff um it, it would help a lot of bands actually to be honest like it would it would be very helpful um because i mean obviously we're in an era where you can discover the underground probably easier than ever before but um it, even still like word of mouth and and social media and all that kind of stuff like that goes a long way but Sometimes if you have to click through links and, you know, so much shit is being thrown at you on the daily when you're doom scrolling or whatever other bullshit, like, it's nice to, it's nice to just have something put right in your face. Like, here's the song that I want you to listen to, or you curate a playlist or whatever. And, uh, especially for me, like I have horrible ADHD. So like, sometimes I get that option paralysis where I'm like, oh my God, there's so much shit coming out. There's so much music coming out. Sometimes it's very, very nice to just have that concise, like, here, listen to these 10 songs, you know? Yeah, like, absolutely. Like, I kind of, when we first got started, like, we got, like, a bit of press from, like, sort of, like, local papers, blah, blah, blah. And um, one of the questions we were asked was, like, is, like, you know, this a dying sort of medium and things like that? And what are the strengths? That was kind of what I said, like, actually curating the music for somebody as opposed to them just kind of swimming in a big ocean of, like... You yeah, know. yeah, I think, um, like I said, like, you know, you're, the options nowadays of, of the intake of music, and, you know, there's a lot of really good modern heavy metal out there, but there's also a lot of fodder, I think, too, um, that's stuff that's just, like not really trying to reinvent the wheel, but they're more just doing the tribute to priest. They're doing the tribute to maiden, like, which is fine. But like, I think with the sheer amount of choices, I think sometimes that little bit of curation really goes a long way because for me, like, especially because I play, you know, heavy metal on a pretty regular basis. Um, I, I, it needs to be something really special for me to stick out because I, I admittedly I'm a little bit jaded with it um, because, you know, having playing it, you know, now for six, five, six years, um, it can get a little stale. So I, honestly, a lot of times when I'm listening to music, I'm generally not really listening to like modern heavy metal. And I would even say like, I'm pretty picky even when it comes to like eighties and, uh, you know, even late seventies and all that kind of stuff. I'm still pretty picky, but um, I listen to a lot of uh, like oi punk and post punk and um, uh, synth wave stuff. And I look like <clears throat> I can pretty much say the same for everybody in Morgul Blade. That's like everybody loves the Scorpions and everybody loves Dokken and all that kind of shit. Because of course, like you shouldn't be in a heavy metal band if you don't <laughs> like those bands. But like for example, um, Elise, our lead guitarist, like she's really into Italian disco and like goblin and like things like that and then my uh uh drummer is really into like noise rock and like things like that so um i think that's kind of like a real advantage for us is that like we can kind of pull from all these crazy influences and funnel it through the heavy metal um lens and that kind of um allows us to have a little bit of a fresh take on it if that makes sense I know it makes perfect sense because I've found like, uh, and we'll get on to like, like it later, but because we like tend, generally tend to ask like for, you know, like five songs at the end of the it so we can play on the radio show is kind of like a. Sure. I love that. Uh, yeah. Uh, and stuff like that. And the, the bands that are coming up now that I love the most generally have the most surprising picks. And so like I discovered like Goblin as a result of having Green Lung on the show. Yep. 
Like that actually, I feel like for some strange reason, that actually really checks out. But yeah, um, yeah I think uh, my friends in Spell just went on tour with Green Lung. Um, there's, there. I'm not super into, I'm not super into doom metal, like um, modern doom metal most of the time. But they're doing something a little more interesting, I think. Um, yeah, they, not- they really have that like folksy thing going on a little bit, which is super cool. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, we we have our own we have our own like patreon patreon whatever you want to call it and um part of that like just for like the bottom tier or whatever um we do like each one of the members does like a 10 song playlist once per week and like i've already gotten questions being like oh you're not putting you know judas priest on there you're not putting slayer on there and it's like well like while those bands are good do do i do I really need to tell you to listen to like show no mercy? Do I really need to tell you to listen to sin after sin or whatever, like stay in class? Like, I don't really think that I need to tell you that because like, if you need to be told that, then like, do you really like heavy metal in general? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, so amazing. for me, it's more about like exposing um, either super underground, like deep cut heavy metal, or just like stuff that you wouldn't necessarily like find on your own. Um, but uh I think people are always surprised when I say that I'm a big punk guy and, and, and whatnot, but I grew up as a punk kid and, and I learned to play fast and angry before I did anything else, you know? So, and I also like love the DIY ethics of punk. So I really try to like uh, translate that through Morgul Blade a lot because like at the end of the day, like I'm really, I chanced into all of this. Like I, I was a chef for, 10 years in my 20s. I'm 33 now. I was a chef for 10 years in my 20s and working 80 hours a week and just hating my fucking life. And then I got laid off during COVID. So I went from 80 hours a week to zero hours a week. And all of a sudden I was like, well, I'm going to lose my mind. So I wrote the first album purely out of necessity to not go crazy. So um, I you know, I didn't think anything was going to come of this. I didn't think like the demo and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't, I didn't think anything. We literally wrote it in the original guitarist bedroom during COVID um, without any intention of ever doing this. And now five years later, like we kind of chanced into like, I just got back from a German tour and everything else. So don't get me wrong. This is an amazing experience. I just, that wasn't the intention when it first started, but once I realized kind of that, you know, people are into this, I decided to run with it because I've been playing music my whole life. And I really had, you know, nothing to show for it. So um, for me, it was super important to take that chance because, you know, listen, when you're 60 years old, are you really going to look back and be like, damn, I should have worked that overtime or damn, I should have fucking stayed home and watched Sopranos for the 15th time or whatever, you know? So it was for me, it was like, I'm going to regret this for the rest of my life. And, you know, honestly, if, if I could tell 16 year old me, what I'm doing now, I think 16 year old me would think I'm pretty cool. And you know what? I'm perfectly okay with that. No, like, um, I don't think there's any better reason to kind of do what you're doing than, uh, yeah. Like, so it's, so it's just like interesting to me. Cause like we have a slightly political band to the show, uh, usually like along like, you know, class lines, things like that, because we're, me and Olivia are socialists ourselves. And uh, stuff like same. That. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was picking up on that, but it's always that kind of dance that I do with guests, like before. Yeah, well, um, so I, part of the ethos behind me trying to write this music is to give you a sense of escapism because modern life sucks ass, but mm-hmm. also you can still see a lot of effed up shit happening. And to me, like if I have a platform, it's kind of my duty to speak out about that, yeah. especially in the states nowadays, like you got a lot of really effed up stuff and I don't really need to go into it because everybody knows what I'm talking about. But um, I think uh, the first album was the the fell sorcery of bounds was like pure escapism, pure fucking escapism. Just get away from everything. It was during COVID. Everybody was locked up. You know, everybody was trapped in their houses. So like, why not write an album about like swords and, and battles and whatever, and getting away from things. Now, as I've matured as a songwriter and as the world has kind of dwindled into, you know, what it is now, um, you know, it makes a lot of things make me angry and it's cathartic to write about that stuff. And uh, 
Neither Cross nor Crown, like the last song on the, um, yeah, yeah, I see you nodding because you definitely know what I'm talking about, but it's Neither like Cross nor Crown, um, the last song on the album is, um, I. it's actually written about a German peasants rebellion in the 1500s, um, but I use that as kind of the vessel to um, attack the aristocracy on behalf of the working class like and i you know i'm a working class person philadelphia is a working class city um i will never not be working class i i you know i don't care about fucking money i have enough money to live and i really don't i would fucking never earn another penny if it meant i didn't have to if i could feed my cats otherwise you know so um to me, it was really important to get that point across because I think we're getting to the point as a society that it's time to draw the line in the sand and like decide what is important to talk about. And it's funny because I think a lot of people, uh, because Tolkien was like very strictly Catholic and um, there, there's like a lot of people assume that there was a conservative bend to what we were doing. And it's like, they literally couldn't be further from the truth for me, pretty much for everybody else in the band as well. Um, so I wanted to like make that very clear on this album that like, I wasn't fucking around, you know what I mean? Um, and obviously I don't want to, I've turned down patch makers that have had less than reputable bands on their lay on their, on their you know list or whatever i've turned down youtube pages that i don't agree with like i will never sacrifice like my beliefs or my principles for um the sake of fame or any sort of renown because at the end of the day like i said like i'm just a normal fucking dude and i think if you can like look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day in this fucked up world like you're pretty much doing something right yeah absolutely and i think like one of the things, like, like, I hard agree with everything you just said, but, like, you touched on an interesting thread there about the kind of the assumption made about Tolkien's Catholicism and the fact that, yes, a lot of, like, maybe, like, fans of, like, less than decent politics, uh, you know, tend to use Tolkien a lot, and I can see why, because of some elements of it, especially, like, in terms of, like, race and things like that, that he wasn't exactly... You know, yep. like, person of his times, you know, he's born in the 1800s, you know, yep. uh, to an extent. But, like, I also, like, see the amount of people that kind of, like, lean on, like, both medieval and sort of, like, fantasy stuff with more progressive politics. Like, I, you know, like bands like Feminazgul and things like that that kind of go for that. So it's not, it's a very bizarre thing that you can have something like Tolkien that is beloved by both because i know that like he was used like a lot by like sort of the resurgence of fascism like the 1970s he, in italy absolutely absolutely was like yes yep it's it's yeah it's, it's like a, it's it's a whole it could be a podcast within itself actually it could we could go on for hours but i think also that kind of speaks to um how uh how important he was like you know if you escape the political spectrum uh, or if you at least look from without it um the fact that he can be appreciated by all walks of, or his work can be appreciated by all walks of life, um, I think in itself is a, is a pretty big testament to to how massive his work, the scope of his work, actually was. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I don't agree with a lot of the things that he probably would have thought on a personal level, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, the man's been dead for sixty years, seventy years. I, it's pretty irrelevant, I think. Um, yeah. And I've had to answer questions about that before. And it's just like, well, like, it's not, it's not 1955. It's not, you know, whatever, like, it, you can, you can appreciate the man's work, but also like disagree on a spiritual level with what's happening. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that as terms in terms of modern art, like, uh, and at certain NS bands and stuff like that, like I'm not into that stuff. Um, even like the weird, like faux esoteric, like shock value, like psych black metal bands, and you know exactly who I'm talking about. But um, I don't fuck with any of that stuff because that's modern. That's something that's visceral now, um, versus something that kind of was irrelevant, you know, or went out of relevancy 
like of dead man's political thoughts of you know 70 years ago or whatever yeah precisely and like i think thematically within it there's things that anyone can latch on to that are still relevant today like i think like themes of environmentalism in his work and things for like sure that, like a hundred percent relevant but i think that's kind of the the good thing when somebody deals in such abstract that it can to a certain extent you know it, it can be used in like a wider context for centuries to come because i think he was talking about you know whether we agree with like the actual takeaway with it the actual like moral questions within the text i suppose it are like universal things that we're probably going to be arguing about for the next god knows how long you know uh, yep yeah, agree agree and yet again that's just a testament to how important his work actually was um you know i've obviously read the books i can't even tell like dozens and dozens of times yeah, I mean, so no, yeah well there you go yep yep i'm covered in talking time yep so uh, wow so our our stuff was perfect for you so yeah i mean on a more fun note of that so so we're not waxing political too much but on a more fun note of that is like i had mentioned before neither cross nor crown is not a tolkien song um so we do have a couple songs you know sprinkled throughout each album that yeah. deal with the occult and history and folklore because i'm also super interested in all that stuff um so for me, uh, you know, when it comes to the actual Tolkien lyrics, um, it's instead of writing directly pulling from something um, that happened in the books, a lot of times I'm writing uh, almost like glorified fan fiction, I would say, for the for the actual um, lyrics, um, at least in a narrative sense where, like, for example, on the first album, the first song, the Morgul Blade, um, that song is literally just about an like another side story of some poor schlub who got stabbed with the blade, but instead of like instead of Frodo like surviving, this dude just bit it and turned into a wraith as well. So obviously that's not spoken about in the books or anything, but it's fun to talk about, you know. Yeah, like it was something like really cool, like when reading it, it's like you know the concept the if the shard worked its way further into Frodo, he turned into a wraith, blah, blah, blah. And then it was like, that's quite a cool concept, but we never saw any of these like people who did succumb to that. You know, we only ever saw. Exactly. And that's, that's why to me, that's why it's, it's, it's pure fun when it comes to that kind of stuff. Because like I I started reading these books. The first time I read the fellowship, I was probably eight or nine years old. So I, after, after two decades, two and a half decades of reading these, like, you end up having some internal questions, you know? So, like, w what better way to explore them that you're not necessarily going to get an answer for is just to do it yourself, you know? Um, there's, I mean, TV shows do that kind of stuff all the time where they, like, leave a cliffhanger at the end of a series and you're kind of, like, left to your own device to decide, to decide what happened. And I think that kind of reflects life a little bit, too, where it's like, you don't always get answers to things. So I think... Um, it's important to be able to kind of like whip that up yourself. Now on the flip side, the first, um, the first actual like pull from proper Tolkien that I've done was on the new album with the song spider God. And that is literally pulled from the Silmarillion with Ungoliant and Morgoth stealing the Silmarils and traversing um, the Helcarax or whatever and into, into middle earth and fighting me at, you know, in the, in Beleriand and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's funny when I was writing that song, the lyrics, actually, I usually write the music to these songs before the lyrics and that time um, the lyrics came first. And when I was writing them, I was like, damn, this kind of like, because you're on such an insane, like the Silmarillion is such on, on such an ins insane scope. Um, yeah. It almost was kind of reading when I was writing them as a, like borderline, like mythology lyrics, like a, like, like something like a monomorph or something like that would do because this, the, the sheer size of everything was so massive compared to like very dialed in stuff that I had done before. But actually it, as it turns out, um, Spider God is actually my favorite song on the record, so I'm glad everything worked out uh, yeah. the way it did. Yeah, I, I kind of picked up on the uh, Ungolian uh, theme for that one. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad because a lot of people say shell up and it drives me crazy. No, no, like lyrically it was like rel like relatively obvious, but I think it's like maybe people haven't gone and didn't know who Shelob's mother was. I think that's that's what it is for sure. But then that's that's where I eclipse their nerdity and I <laughs> onto my own level. <laughs> um, 
but yeah like I, I completely appreciate what you were saying about like writing about the Silmarillion because it does take place on like a cosmic level yeah like, exactly in places so like it makes sense that it well it was literally his intention you know like creating the mythology with the Silmarillion yeah it's Genesis basically you know yeah, I mean, like the the first chapter is literally just his own take on Genesis, and it, it even the language feels like right reading like the King James Bible or something. Yep, yep, yep. I don't. I think all of that was on purpose too. Like he he knew what he was doing for sure. Um, now I haven't read the Silmarillion nearly as many times as I've read the the trilogy and the Hobbit and whatnot. Yeah. But um, Silmarillion, Silmarillion can, I think it can be a little difficult to piece through at, at times. So. Um, if if people can sit, you know, if people can consi consistently get through it and read it, then more power to you. Because it took me a long time to piece through that because it's massive and it is uh, precise and verbose, and some of it is completely negligible. I would even say so. Yeah, you know. yeah, and I I think. I probably, were I to attempt to read it now, would not have the patience for it, whereas being a teenager where I had nothing but time on my hands and stuff like that, I could nerd out and, like, piece everything together and spend... That's when I, I mean, that's exactly when I read it. I, yeah. I, I was not the teenager that was going to the parties. I was a teenager that was rolling joints in my basement and, and reading Tolkien. So <laughs> a, that's what I had time for, you know? Yeah, uh, same. <laughs> um, yeah, like, it's... This is like flowing really well because like literally like um I've got like a list of questions and just sort of uh, naturally I'm just been accidentally ticking all these off because it's just like led onto a lot. Of great, this. that's great. I'm in no um, rush, so I have my drink. I'm ha I'm a happy man. So um sort of talking aside because like honestly I this could turn into a three hour podcast. It, it definitely could, and, and it has before. <laughs> yeah, I mean would be more than happy to do that but i'm pretty sure you would like to talk about the new record released on no remorse uh, for sure heavy metal rights it uh i loved it it's a, for me it's like the first like really good trad metal album that's came out like this year um yeah um thank you no thank you. no honestly like it was it, it's a sincere opinion it's not just you know trying to uh compliment conjecture you. yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh no i appreciate that um yeah, you know, I mean, I think this record, um, I'm trying to think how to put this in an eloquent fashion. Uh, I think this record is just more of a realization of what I was trying to accomplish with the general idea of the band, because yeah. I can't sing for shit. So I was really never interested in including clean vocals. Um, the, you know, our drummer does the clean vocals, and I really wanted to focus this time around on leaning into the wickedness and the evil side a little bit more so if you notice there's not really as many heroic you know songs on this on this record um and uh but i also wanted to keep the ethos of like a of a, an 80s heavy metal album uh while adding kind of my own flair and um we we exper experimented with different timings and there's a db you know there's a db part on it there's disco beats on this one mm -hmm. um and I think it was just it was important for me to not write the entire record in like a four four timing or uh, and it's really just an obelisk to like everything that I fucking like to listen to you know like you'll you'll hear if you know where to listen you'll you'll hear some punk in there um, if you really know where to listen like my favorite band of all time is AFI but it's the like I particularly like the mid era of AFI like um, the All Hallows EP Black Sails in the Sun and Art of Drowning and if you know where to listen in that. Uh, you can hear a lot of that in there as well, um, especially with melodies and stuff. Because um, I'm not a super proficient guitarist. Like I was a drummer. Uh, I was a drummer at first, and I guess technically I still am. But um, for me, um, it's not really about technical prowess as just uh, as much as just making sure shit sounds catchy and good. Um, and I know it kind of sounds like a cop out, but it's really how I believe. Uh, um, because there's not really guitar solos on the record; they're more melodies, yeah. um, leads, harmonies, um, and I think that also kind of gives us a little bit of iniquity as well when it comes to like tra traditional heavy metal. There's a lot of people that like grew up listening to Ingve and all that kind of stuff, and they're just shredding or George Lynch or Randy Randy mm -hmm. Rhodes or whatever. And they're just shredding through shit 
which is cool, which is totally cool, but it's just not really like what I'm trying to accomplish with this band because the songs in themselves are standalone stories. And I think that shredding like kind of pulls away from like um, the narrative, if that makes sense. Yeah, like it's kind of the um, the way that like in certain songs it almost like distracts from it and does the song actually need this when it becomes almost like a kind of like an athletic thing just you know like yeah like, exactly yeah like, i mean look which i mean if you can do sweeps on your guitar and you can you can shred and dive bomb more power to you it's just not really my it's not really my thing it's never really been my thing and that kind of comes into like the punk thing again too like the diy thing it's just like do the best with what you have with what you know you know what i mean so this record i definitely think is just like a, a more stark realization of like what Morgul Blade is supposed to be. And I personally think that this record is way better than the first record. Don't get me wrong, I will always love Fell Sorcery Abounds because of how it got me it got me here and all that kind of stuff. But um as far as like uh artist satisfaction, I would say that this is not even close. Uh has made me a lot more happy with the finished product than the first one for sure. Yeah, like it's it's always like so. One of the questions that I had here, and it, this kind of leads on perfectly to it, was obviously like Fell Sorcery Abounds was quite well received. You know, like um, it got like a lot of love on release. We played tracks off it um, several times on the radio, and would get people like messaging, being like, "Oh, what was that? That was so cool!" and stuff like that. And that blending of traditional heavy metal with more like black metal elements and stuff, it was, it just it was perfect for me at least. Um, and then you obviously coming to write a second album there's a bit of pressure there were you feeling that because I, I feel like it was like like heavy metal wraiths just took everything from fell sorcery and just kind of like turned it up to 11 refined it the production was a bit better and you know kind of it was yeah the um same, but more and better uh that i totally agree with that i think that's it's it's just like i said like it's it's just a concentrated and a little bit more focused like us learn like i mean i guess that's a natural part of the creative process too is you just realizing what you're good at and leaning into that a little bit more so i would definitely agree with you on that as far as the actual pressure of writing the album um it's a tough question because it depends on how you define pressure because as far as creative pressure goes i would say no because on this record we kind of like i added jimmy on bass and Elise on guitar because the, the the two previous members who were on the first record really couldn't tour. Um, one of them was just having a kid and just got married, and there was no bad blood or anything. But it was just like I like I'm I quit my job to do this basically. So like this is time for like I'm going to do it now, and they they couldn't commit to that level. So it was like okay. So then you know we enlisted Jimmy and Elise, and I would say creatively the pressure was relieved a lot because they are musicians of a different stature than I am. Um, Elise has her own band, Heavy Temple, which is incredible, um, like rock and roll, psych rock. Um, they also just came out with a new record. Jimmy has had more projects than I can count under his belt. He's a very proficient songwriter. So like the, the way this record worked, at least as far as the writing process goes um, or went, um, really kind of pulled a lot of pressure off my back uh, because I wasn't on the hook for doing the entire thing as much. This was far more a collaborative process. Now, I will say, timing-wise, it was a little bit rougher because when we had gotten invited to play Keep It True, like this time last year, our label, who is also a huge sponsor of Keep It True, reached out and they were like, hey, we would really like it if you had the new record done in time, you know, for, for your appearance next year. And we really didn't have, we had three songs um, of what we have on the new record. So we kind of had to take last summer and really like really crunch. And we actually like really didn't even practice the songs as a, well, at least half the songs as a band before recording them. We kind of just knew our own parts, layered them in, and then learn them after they were recorded. Um, now, that's not the case for Beneath the Black Sails, Spider God, and Heavy Metal Wraiths. We already had those. Um, but the rest of them, 
uh, it was it was a lot more of like a, okay let's make sure they're done first and then like we can go back and learn them uh, so in the recording process it was a lot more of like trading off like jimmy wrote most of razor sharp so like I, I have no ego when it comes to this shit. So like whatever is the best avenue to get things done. I was like, if you can play this guitar part better than I can, please just play it. You know, like, like for the sake of time, for the sake of continuity, for the sake of just getting it the F done. So um, we finished recording it in like October of 2023. And then, you know, Will is our, drummer but he's also does all of our production and everything too and he's an immensely gifted and immensely talented person um so we kind of just let him cook for a couple months in the mixing and mastering process and uh i know not to bother him too much when it comes to that so uh at that point you know early december mid-december right around christmas um he sent he sent the finished product and I sent it immediately over and no remorse was like, Oh, you guys just got it just in time. If it had been any later after Christmas, like it probably wouldn't have come out in time. So I was like, phew, you know? So that timeline pressure, which is like a very real pressure, like that's a real thing. But as far as creative pressure, I trust myself enough to know like where, wherever it takes me is probably where it needs to go. I know that's kind of abstract, but that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. I think you kind of have to, when you're talking about like something creative, it has to be spoken about in abstraction because it's, you know, it's such a weird thing you're doing in general. Like, you know, like, but just the creative process in general, you can't spell out, I do X, Y, and Z, and then I have a song. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, as far as the actual songwriting process for me goes, I've kind of learned that like, um, not to question things too much, like to trust my first or second instinct. And that's usually like the songwriting process for me personally, at least, and it's pretty much the same for the rest of the band is like, it's extremely sporadic. Like, uh, like I said, I have, I have horrible ADHD. So it's a focus is a real thing for me. So usually uh, what will happen, it will be bursts of, you know, of inspiration. So like, yeah there will be three weeks and i'll have nothing and you know like some days i'm just scrolling through my bullshit phone or whatever and then all of a sudden boom two songs are done in two days then nothing for six weeks then boom two songs are done in two days you know so and i i know elise works the same way and i know will works the same way and sometimes you just catch that creative spark and you kind of got to ride it and that's the point where like that's the point where like once that happens you like you can't like you have to embrace that because it could go away just as fast as it came. So like, you got to ride that to the point of fruition, to the point that you're fucking done, or at least you feel good enough with the bones of what you have in front of you that you're like, okay, now I can take a break and come back to it and hone it a little bit more or tweak it a little bit more or whatever. But generally speaking, when it comes to that kind of process, usually the first or second gut instinct for myself, at least is usually the way to go. No, that, that's incredibly relatable because I, I'm on the spectrum myself and it's kind of like that thing of when the hyper focus kind of like hits and you're actually like in the right headspace for it. And it's why kind of like working a full time job really fucking sucks because maybe it really like, sucks. Like what maybe maybe like in the evening or something like that. That's when it's like things are actually flowing and going. And it's like, no, nah, I got to go to bed because I'm in work at six in the morning or something like that. You know, it's literally man, literally. And that's um. You know, going back to my time as a chef, that's something that I kind of suppressed in myself for, for a long time because, you know, I was running a brewery uh, right outside of Philadelphia. And, um, you you know, what as a professional cook, especially a high ranking one, you really don't give yourself much time for pretty much anything else. You know, um, I had no time for family. I had no time for music. I had no time for sports. I had no time for really anything that I like to do. And then all of a sudden you look, you know, especially as a neurodiverse person, like you get caught in a cycle of comfortability like that. You're not really realizing it until you have the opportunity to take a step outside of it and look in. Yeah. So um, I kind of got caught in that. And then once I got laid off, I realized I was like, oh, what? Like you can like you can enjoy yourself like you're allowed to feel joy and you're allowed to feel creativity. And all of these things kept started rushing back and um I almost felt like I needed to make up for lost time because I lost my entire twenties to the fucking grind, basically. Yeah. Um, 
And now I work a job that's about 30 hours a week. And fucking if you're, if, if I'm being perfectly honest, I even think that's too fucking much. Um, but it's better than 80. So um, it allows me, you know, I still have to get up somewhat early and the hyper focus does come in. And sometimes I sleep two hours, whatever. Um, but it does allow a little more room you know, for, for what I, for the joy in life, because really in life, I, if you really want to break it down on like a, on a profound level to me, it's, there's joy and there's no joy. And it's really like, what do you want to pick? Do you want to pick joy or do you want to pick fucking misery? And to me, uh, you get one opportunity to do this um, and uh, to squander it, I think would be uh a real uh, tragic instance because um, think back, you know, uh, how it through history and even in the past 50 years, like how many people have suppressed an idea that they've had. We don't, we'll never know the answer, you know? Yeah. Sorry. Like, that's like, that's one of those thoughts that just sort of keeps me awake at like two in the morning that I've had so many times, like how many, like, in whatever field like physics anything like how many people have died lived and died that could have made huge contributions to humanity yep. but because of economic reasons we're never actually allowed to follow that and then you know where would we be as a society if i agree i think that's a, i think that's a real thing and i think people kind of push that out of their minds a little bit but if you really think about that uh, it's it's you know, I'm not even talking about like like you said, like scientifically, you know, musically, creatively, artistically, yeah. all of those things. Like, um, but because the way Western society is, um, you know, laid out, you have to worry about like whether or not your lights are going to get turned off, and you're not going to be able to cook dinner, and if you have food. So, it's a shame because I think art is like one of the most beautiful things that can be contributed to life. Like not really much you know i'm getting fairly profound here but like not not really much can make you feel things like like art does you know uh whether art be a music piece a painting or whatever you know like yeah. anything can be that that's 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 the uh objective thing about it but um it upsets me to think about that kind of stuff because a lot of times um I've, I've known people that have they're immensely talented individuals that like can't embrace uh, what they're doing because of necessities. So that, you know, obviously that goes back into my political spectrum thing a little bit, yeah. but, but you know, that's just how I feel. And you know, I'm not fucking sorry. I don't care if somebody listens to this and is like, Oh, I disagree with you. I don't care. Like, I don't care. Cause I, I, I know that I'm right deep down and they probably know that I'm right deep down too, but there's some sort of weird hang up that they have. So yeah, and I think that there might be like a cognitive dissonance, but when if we take away all of the scary labels like socialism, communism, and just start talking like deep down about the material things that are actually, you know, driving people into an early grave or just making their lives miserable, we can yep. all kind of agree on those what those things are. And yeah, it's it's kind of a it's a thing that kind of the I, I don't know to what extent it's the same in the US, but like over here we have a very small amount of people all with the same ideology that kind of control the press. Uh, I mean it's the exact it's, yeah. it's the same. And not just that, they will create a kind of they will structure where you can actually have debate. So like there is this little parameter in which you can debate these ideas, maybe like tax policy, something like that, but then like anything like and then they ha encourage healthy debate within that, but then like outside of that, actually trying to do anything that's going to address things at the root cause of a lot of societal problems, you're dismissed as somebody crazy or, you know. Well, and I, I think that kind of, again, that kind of moves into the idea. It's like uh, the antithesis of, of everything that we have discussed today is really uh, corporatocracy, uh, you know, corporate, corporate um, involvement to a level that like just becomes inhuman. And I know it sounds harsh, but like, I don't think that you can be a full human and like embrace that aspect of, of society. Like if you're in a high ranking corporate job, sure, whatever, maybe you make 500,000 a year or whatever, but like really like to me, there's no way you can do that without some sort of exploitation of your fellow man. Um, yes. So I'm not really interested in like 
having a debate about that with somebody because I'm pretty like, and I know that sounds closed minded, but like, I'm pretty like, I've seen it. Like I've worked for corporate places when I, in my twenties, I've worked, I went to college. I have student loans out the ass. Like that shit is all predatory. And uh, to me, that's not really like what life's about. And uh, that's kind of the beautiful thing about Tolkien. If we're going to go full circle on it yeah. is like, that kind of gives you the appreciation for his uh, more uh, pastoral aspects of what he's trying to accomplish, you know? Yeah, and it's the kind of thing of, uh, I don't think we're ever going to go back to that, like, agrarian society that, you know, when you see, like, the Shire, you kind of, like, you know, it's it's, it's almost utopian in a way because it's his, like, idealised concept of, like, the English peasant and things yep. like that. But, like, um, we'll never go back to it, but I think it does harken back to people just wanting a simple life in which their material needs are met, and then they can live comfortable and then like you know pursue you know like hobbits it might be gardening it might be the, the small things that bring them joy well it's pursuits of happiness really i think yeah and you know I, like america at least america you know was founded on the tenet of that but i think that we kind of lost what the meaning of that is um because nowadays it's not really um it's really not even close to that anymore like uh you know I, like you have to go to the grocery store and like oh, a, a, an entire two days wages will, you know, cover of less than a week worth of food. And it's like, you can't even have that pursuit of happiness now. And then there's people that argue, it's like, oh, well, you need to work like more. And it's like, okay, so I work 80 hours a week to like get the bare needs just so I can go back to work. Like, it's like at that point, like what the fuck is the point of living? <laughs> like yeah. what the fuck is the point of living? And I know that sounds bleak, but like, I have just like in my early thirties up to now, like I have kind of just realized that like, I don't want to really be a part of that. I mean, it, yeah, it is bleak, but we're living in bleak times, which are only getting like accelerated and made worse because like, it's kind of like we've again, not to get to, you know, to turn this into like a discuss, you know, a discussion of political theory, but it's like, we're almost entering a stage beyond capitalism at this point now, which yeah. is, even more i mean it's it's almost come the way i think about it and this is we can change the subject after this but the, uh, the way i think about it is actually we've exited capitalism and we've moved into corporate feudalism yes um it, so. uh, yeah that's a term that like i've came back to quite a few times and you're kind of seeing like these huge whether it be tech companies or kind of like and i i think like a lot of those kind of like um you know like cyberpunk dystopias like, like the kind of like things that were written about in the 80s are coming true when you look at uh because i've been a great giant nerd here i've been like uh reading through like uh the tabletop game that you know was the basis for cyberpunk 2077 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then like reading like the law section it's talking about like corporations eventually having their own armies and almost functioning like nations yeah uh yeah i mean uh, I just watched the Fallout series, um, and I actually really don't watch a lot of TV. Um, pretty much never, but there's like maybe two or three shows a year that I get into. But uh, I played Fallout religiously when I was younger, so I watched the series. And um, it's ironic that it's coming from you know Amazon, which is like the absolute most evil corporation on the entire planet. Yeah. I don't even have Amazon Prime; like I use my mom's to do it. Um, <laughs> I will, I don't order from Amazon. I don't, I don't fuck with Amazon, but um, people told me like, Oh, you got to watch the show. So, All right, watch the show. And uh, it, it's literally about like a corporation that is responsible for ending the fucking world, you know, through, through like conscious action, not even through mistake. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think there's a, there's a level of that. That's kind of startlingly realistic at this point in time. And that's the thing, when the Fallout law was sort of created decades ago, um, it was this heightened satire that, you know, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. and now it's becoming prophetic. Yeah, it, precisely, and it's kind of terrifying, but yeah. <laughs> like I said, I, I don't really, I don't, I really don't watch a lot of TV. Like, I, I watch, I watch the NFL, I watch the Premier League, um, and maybe a couple a year that i get into but mostly like i just watch the same shit over and over again like i love the, the shitty low-grade paranormal television shows and um 
you know, uh, stuff like that. But it's it's more like a comfort watch with background noise for me rather than like trying to take something from it. Um, and then, you know, every once in a while, there's a series that I actually get into, but it, they're they're pretty far and few between. I can't imagine just like uh, cycling through bullshit because I think a lot of times television, and this comes back to my ideals, but a lot of times television, I think, is made with the um, intent to make money off of it. And I feel like you can immediately, immediately tell when that is the case, you know, um, and there's very few instances that can convince me otherwise because obviously everything in our society is created with the intent of that but i think it's it's far more palpable with a lot of television shows than, than it is with other things movies is the same way too i haven't seen a new movie and i can't even tell you how long because it just doesn't it just doesn't do anything for me you, you can tell that it's been through about 50 different focus groups and kind of like we need to take box a b and c and there needs to be love interest there needs to be this blah 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 you know kind of like exactly just, yeah just just so that it can fit into that marketable demographic exactly That's why when a film comes out that completely bucks that trend and is weird as fuck that usually tends to resonate with me more agree agree uh it's just far and few between <laughs> yeah um yeah i uh i've also really dug the fallout series but i'm not sure how much of it was nostalgia or, or not. yeah that me too me too for sure um i think uh i think that's definitely something to be said for that but uh i think as far as uh modern television goes i, I would say it's far superior to most things oh absolutely it managed to keep me engaged for like eight episodes which is kind yeah of me too which is impossible <laughs> usually so um yeah so like um we kind of touched on it before but like one thing i wanted to ask about is like the introduction of like elise and stuff like obviously like you had like um you know pretty large lineup changes between between the first and second record um that's added like a lot like especially like the lead lines like even like the opening lead bits and like eagle strike and things like yep. that it's like it's been like a and you know not so shit on your previous guitarists or anything but like it was just such a step up and kind of is like yep added a whole new element to the band like I, I wonder if you could just maybe like talk about sure um what what the new lineups kind of added. So like you said, we had kind of touched on this before, but um Elise is a very accomplished musician. Jimmy is a very accomplished musician, and Will is a very accomplished musician. Now, Will was on the first record, but he kind of chanced into the first record as well, because our first drummer also wasn't really allowed or not allowed i'm sorry uh wasn't really practicing enough and um he was an old friend of mine i still got a lot of love for him but it was just like i'm trying to do this um and sometimes you gotta you know you gotta make things happen and there's a definite there's a definite like machiavellian sensibility to like running a band and making sure a band's successful now i was always very upfront about how the way things would work but um at least with Will or with, with Elise and Jimmy, um, you know, I had replaced the two previous members because, like I said, one had just gotten married and had a kid and the other one was just because of work reasons or whatever else was not able to tour and I was just trying to make things happen. So um, Will added Jimmy um, because he had recorded his other band. Um, so he knew him and me and Jimmy took to each other right away. We're very similar. We're both Virgos. Uh, we're born within a week of each other. So we have a lot of very similar uh, idiosyncrasies and stuff. So we really get each other. We also have me and Jimmy, and I'll go on a little tangent here real quick, but me and Jimmy also have a uh, side project that I'm not sure a lot of people know about, but um, it's uh, it's called Orb. And it's uh, we, we did it for, we released it on Halloween of 2023. And um, it's, I call it haunted punk. I don't really know what else to call it. Um, th there's post punk to it. There's death rock to it. Um, but it's very influenced by like Sam Haynes, November coming fire and um, joy division and uh, like 60s psych garage rock and stuff. And we kind of like when Will was, you know, cooking with the actual Morgo album, we kind of had that opportunity to like 
because my brain's always moving. I just need to do stuff. And I love like that kind of like I love Danzig and all his adjacent yeah. projects. Like he's pretty much my favorite artist of all time. Like I love the Misfits. I love Sam Hain. Sam Hain's pretty much maybe my favorite band of all time. Um, like I literally have 15 Sam Hain shirts in my drawer at home. And when I went on tour to Germany, I like I brought seven of them with me and I just wore a different one every day. And my bandmates are like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> so I, I really love that shit. And I've always and I love Halloween and I love fucking spooky shit. And I love ghosts and I love like I'm way into that stuff. Um so I always wanted to do a project with it. So I kind of approached Jimmy with it and um you know, uh, he was like, oh, like he likes Danzig and stuff, too. And he loves Halloween, and black cats and all that kind of stuff. So um, it kind of worked itself out that uh, I was like, do you want to do this? You know, do you want to do this? Like, you want to like because I was going to do it regardless. But I was like, do you want to do it? And he's very, very solid songwriting chops. So it, we kind of just pulled together on that and made that happen. And uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. So me and Jimmy really gravitated towards, towards each other musically, creatively, personally, very quickly. And Elise came in and, um, you know, uh, Elise is a supremely talented musician. She's one of my best friends in the world. Um, but I didn't really know her super well when she joined the band. It was just more like a, out of necessity because we had another, we actually had a third guitarist that was in the band for about a month before we were we played a show or two with him and he had some personal things happen so he had to withdraw from the band and we had a pretty massive um fest date in 2022 coming up so um elise you know uh was at the time she was just like well you know i can i can learn the songs and jump in and she learned them so successfully and she has such a um she has such a unique way of playing um, that like she, she fitted so seamlessly into the actual project. She was never meant to be a full-time member. And then here we are, you know, almost two years later and she's still in it. She's got album credits and everything. She's also an incredible singer um, and uh, a good songwriter. So it, like, it was never meant to be a permanent thing. She was literally just doing us a favor, but then she ended up enjoying herself. And I was like, Hey, you know, when we're in our thirties, it's fucking not easy to find band members, yeah. you know, um, especially even in a city big, as big as Philadelphia, but people with time and the want to do it is goes a long way. It, it just kind of worked its way out that I was like, Hey, do you just want to do this full time? And now she's one of my best friends in the world. And, yeah, put amazing guitar work on the second record. Yeah, I I know what you mean about that. I'm 29 and attempting a musical project at the minute, and I'm I'm grappling with the same things of being in a band with friends that maybe don't really want to take it. You know, like like make it like as much of a serious part of their life. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, I, I kind of I'm at you know nothing. It's not for it. everybody, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's nothing like personal against them. It's just obviously people have other priorities in life. Yep. And then it's also like finding people that do really want to take it seriously is is very difficult. Like me and Olivia are in like a kind of I don't know, like kind of like a, a atmospheric, like Agalocky kind of um... cool. Agaloc is one of my main influences for for Morgan Blade, which I know is kind of strange to hear, but it is at least no, vocally. No, no, no it, it ma makes sense. Like I could see like the Caladan Brood shirt and stuff like that. So like it obviously. Like, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. done physical. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I saw you did an interview with uh, Jeff Young from uh, By Fire and Sword and um, Yeah, yeah. Weld and Woe, and you were wearing a Galibrade shirt in that one. So clearly you're familiar with Jake's projects. <laughs> oh, I, I interviewed Jake a few months ago. Oh, very cool. Um, very, he's like, a, in, like, very sweet dude. Very sweet dude. Yeah, like in person, it was like a really cool night like so we got press for our first ever festival the festival fell through and stuff uh and then a bunch of local promoters in the middle of a brewery just put on a three-day festival with a bunch of bands from the lineup who'd flow in the uk it was amazing and then we got to got to met jake uh um did the interview and like two minutes before i went you know like i was about to interview jake you know loving visigoth but not knowing he was the guy that did caladan brood my friend <laughs> Yeah. My friend Andy goes, by the way, you know that's the guy that wrote Echoes of Battle, and I'm like... You're and like I, I, yeah, and you can... It's That's one of my favourite albums of all time. And you can yep. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing album. Yep. Very special we, album. 
and then we went out to like an after party with him and a bunch of other stuff and it just it was just a and that's a, that, again crazy. again that just is a testament like jake's just a normal dude and he's just yeah. he gets he gets his joy through through doing this stuff and um it, i think you know a lot of us whether or not where our stature is or whatever. I think a lot of us are really just doing this for all the same reasons, which is a really cool thing. Um, and I, like you said, you're doing your project and you, you know, there's going to come a time where you, you, you are going to have to make decisions. Like if you want to, if you want to take it seriously, or if you don't or whatever, and you know, there's nothing wrong with whatever decision you make, it's whatever you can live with. Mm. Um, so what kind of, so you said you're doing like a, a atmospheric black metal or something. Yeah, it's that kind of like idea of having like the kind of like folk elements to it, and like we've got like sort of like one track like uh, penned out, and the 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 concept that I'm kind of like writing lyrics around right now is um like about Welsh history mythology. Very cool. And, uh, I'm sure there's about, a lot to choose from with that. Uh, there is. I like, I'm I'm like a no like I I'm I'm not not actually there this weekend, and I'm sad about it. But um, the this sort of like May Day bank holiday weekend, I'm usually dressed in chainmail like. In a, a a Kenilworth castle with a bunch, like I'm in part of a reenactment society. I'm very cool, open. very cool. So you're yeah. way into it, basically. Yeah, yeah. But at least, at least you know, like that when you're writing your lyrics and your content or whatever, at least you know that it's coming from a very honest place. Like it's not contrived at all because you actually give a shit about it, which is super important. Well, I've, I yeah, I've had to scrap lyrics because it's been like difficult trying to write about my heritage and culture without it coming across as very like sketchy yeah yeah exactly Whereas, <laughs> you know yeah my, my point of view is anyone can move to wales consider themselves welsh and want to be part of this culture sure and, and enrich our culture and sure stuff like that. but um it, it's hard when i want to write about like you know those kind of like agalock esque kind of lyrics about how you know the feeling that you get from like the landscape and all of that. I understand. I understand what you're saying. I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I, I I'm sure you'll figure it out because there's definitely a way to do that without sounding like some sort of crazed nationalist or whatever. Um, because I mean, you can be an appreciator of anything. It's just a matter of like the vessel that you choose to translate that in. You know. Um, but even talking to you uh, from this hour that we've been talking, I don't think that anything that you could possibly write would be coming off as anything other than genuine. You know, <laughs> like I, I I hope so, and that's very kind of you to say. Um, yeah. So, uh, one thing I want to ask, probably like a bit of a boring question, but like, any plans to tour the UK? Uh, for sure. Um, we actually, so like I, I just mentioned, uh, you know, we, we did, we just did Germany and we made the mistake of trying to do a DIY. Um, now when you go into another continent, um, you know, I can, I can throw together a U.S. tour, no problem. And we have done that. No problem. Yeah. DIY. You're going to another continent. It's not as easy. So I got a little bit too big for my britches and try to do that. And I kind of fell flat on my face. Um, we only managed, we actually managed about six shows, but they were so scattered that it wouldn't financially make sense to do it, which is the yeah. fucking sad part. Cause I would love to do it all. But we had one in Barcelona. We had one in Pisa, Italy. We had one in tours, France, and they're all like 16 hours apart from each other. Yeah. So it like day after day, like how you, it's just, unless you have some sort of, time vessel to to navigate it's really not uh, practical to like try to figure any of that out so we ended up just doing germany we had a couple shows in germany we looked into the uk um but of course because of the fucking tories and brexit uh that makes things extremely difficult um yes. th there's all sorts of bullshit paperwork there's all sorts of um there's all sorts of passport issues visa stuff taxes um so yes we are definitely going to do it but i think financially the only way for us to do it and not like make ourselves destitute would be to do a full uk tour rather than just like the big three you know birmingham london manchester or whatever have that be yeah. um it would probably or birmingham or glasgow or whatever i think it would need to be something where we just we just go to the uk and do 11 to 12 shows just there and yeah Okay, so that, that's interesting because I know just coming again, like circling back to something we previously mentioned, um, Jeff recently posted about him looking to 
sort of like get something here in the UK, ask me, I, I sent him like the contact details of like some promoters and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. that might be interested and stuff like that and maybe i don't know uh, just as a suggestion maybe buddying up with him or something like that like for, yeah uh, i mean that's like, another thing too i think uh we would definitely need to do would probably go with another band consistently um i have very good friends in a band called devil master i'm not sure if oh, you're yeah. familiar yeah um they're uh the guitarist of devil master is one of my best friends on the planet um but he has been touring a uh, touring musician our whole adult lives basically and he um kind of got to the point where with the uk and this is just furthering what i already thought but he was basically just like you kind of need another band to do it number one like you can't just go by yourself unless you have like festival offerings and whatever else and number two you need to have like multiple dates like it can't just be like because i see a lot of like I do see some bands like from the EU go to go in and just do like London, uh, you know, Birmingham or Manchester and then Glasgow. And it's like, I just don't see how you can do that and then come home and not be like so far in the hole that like you wouldn't even like you can't like you can't pull yourself out of it. Um, And like I said, I don't really give a shit about profit or making money off of this because inherently art should not be like used to profit off of but like i do think that like there's something to be said about coming home and still being able to feed your fucking cats you know what i mean so because this is a lot of work so i think to, to at least break even is an important thing um so and that's something that i've kind of learned in the past couple of years like i've learned the business side of it a little bit more and i don't necessarily like want to but like Otherwise you're just screwing yourself like over and over again. So there is a, there's an, you know, there's a necessary evil there. Um, But Dan, to long story short, answer your question. Yes, we will definitely be in the UK at some point. Um, I obviously have a lot of ties to the UK. Like, you know, I have heritage over there. I have family that has lived over there. Uh, Obviously the, the sporting aspect of it, I would love to get to a Premier League game. I'd love, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. So, uh eventually yeah i mean i would say in the next two years i'd expect to expect to see us over there for sure excellent and um, that's usually depressingly that's usually the answer that we receive when we do ask that for like you know like uh us or even european bands that it's like it's just the, the issue of like visas and everything post it wasn't like that until brexit yeah and it's just it's just like fuck who would have thought leaving the eu would have been a bad idea whoa well <laughs> we, we, you know, I kind of wish more people would have had the the foresight, but anyway, yeah, well, that, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a minefield, but like, um, for sure, I'm more more than happy to declare as one of the uh, forty eight percent of votes for America. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> At least you could hang your hat on that, my friend, for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so kind of like rounding out the show and stuff like that, because I'm like, I'm, I'm just like looking at the clock and, you know, it's usually try to get this done in like an hour, but I, I feel like this is going to like run long, which I don't mind. It's been a, it's been a fun conversation and stuff. For but, sure. Uh, as I was saying before, like um, we usually ask uh, uh, all of our guests to pick five songs to play on the radio. Sure. Um, you know, uh, that can be either songs that have just like personally had an impact on them or like stuff that's a very clear influence on the band that they're here to promote, whatever you prefer, really. So, okay. So five songs. Let's start here. Uh, There is a, this is a super deep cut. um, Mm -hmm. And this is, this is not an influential thing to any extent, but it's just uh, an album and a song that I really, really fucking enjoy. But um, there's a French, this is going to sound wild, but there's a friend. I'm a big fan of, French extreme music in general. I think French black metal is tip top. I think French oi punk is tip top. Top. I think French post punk is tip top. Something about the French, they just certain things they just do really well. So there is a uh, French band called Paris Violence, and they are a. This is going to sound wild, but they are an oi punk slash trad metal slash black metal band. No, um, it doesn't sound weird at all. I'm I'm thinking like mid two thousands Dark Throne. Maybe. Kind of, honestly, yeah. kind of. A um, little more synth heavy okay. um, and That's a little more like post punky, maybe, but you're kind of in that in that vein. But it's called Paris Violence, and the song is called A Lombre, which is L apostrophe O M B R E D E S 
Immortels, and I M M O R T E L S. Okay. So that's one. So that album uh, in itself is a fucking. Inc- oh shit! I just pressed play on it. Um, <laughs> the album is called New Somme de Trop. I don't speak French, but New Somme de Trop Tar, and I'll put it up to the thing so you can see it right here. Yeah. Okay. Everybody should listen to that album. A lot of people don't know that band, and it it tickles so many fucking little itches and scratches. Uh, people don't realize how good it is. Uh, let's see. The next one, let's see here. Uh, let's see. The next one would be The Damned Street of Dreams from the record Phantasmagoria. And that's a uh, mid-era Damned song. And it's it's sort of when they start going into that gothy. I guess they were always kind of gothy, but this is kind of like new wavy gothy with like saxophone and cool synth. Um, and it's still extremely dark and extremely melodic. Um it's a very slept on record and I'll put that up against the screen so everybody can see that as well. Boop right there, right there. It's just a lady in a cloak. You got to love the ladies in the cloak. Absolutely. And then uh, I'll go more in the traditional metal of things and influential things for me. Uh, My favorite modern traditional heavy metal band uh, is a band from Eastern Europe. They're called Malacarpetan and I'm not sure uh, a lot of people know about them, but if you don't know about them, you should. Um, now I will say that all of their, all of their lyrics are in middle Slavic. Okay. So, uh, it's, the dude is a genius. He, he, um, he, it's all the albums have standalone stories. Uh, they're all concept albums. Uh, the, he had a new one come out last October. They're all very autumnal sounding records, but they really, mix the black metal and heavy metal thing really well. And I would say that they are where we are like heavy metal with twinges of black metal. I would say that they are black metal with twinges of heavy metal. If that makes sense. Um, Same kind of vocal stylings as me, like harsh, um, but still kind of legible, if that makes sense. Um, And their, their newest album is called Vertumnus Caesar. Uh, And I, for the love of God, I, I, I don't even like it might be even better if I just send you on Instagram what the what the album thing is. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Because I th- it's literally like a three sentence long album or song title in in middle Slavic. So I'm gonna but if you don't know that band, <laughs> yeah, but if you don't know that band, um, you should do yourself a favor and dive into their full discography, because I think they are the absolute most incredible heavy metal band of our generation. So for um, a point of clarification, when you say Middle Slavic, do you mean like medieval Slavic? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, they also use um, heavy synth. So there's like goblin aspects to them. They have folky aspects to them. They have heavy metal aspects to them. Uh, they have occult aspects to them. They are a truly, truly, truly special project. Um, and I always say it to people because I always expect people to like know who the fuck I'm talking about, but I'm always surprised that a lot of people don't know them. Once you hear them, you're going to be like, Oh my God. Um, And they don't tour or anything. I'm pretty sure it's just a studio project, Um, but they are like a a truly special, special, special thing. Um, But anyway, I'll move on from them, but be sure to whoever's watching this, be sure that you're checking this band out because they are fucking incredible. Um, no, I think um, you've done a good job selling them. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll move on from them, and let's move on to let's see, let's see. Big, big influence. A big, another big influential thing for me. Uh, Queensrÿche. Um, the, obviously, I mean, most people know Queensrÿche, but uh, the first album or the first EP. I'm sorry, uh, Night Rider on that first EP. Fucking incredible song. Um, really dials in that fucking. Uh, proto heavy metal early 80s thing before they mm-hmm. they started getting a little bit proggier as they went on but um that first ep is like heavy metal majesty and it's like jeff tate when he was like 19 years old just like ripping his vocal cords what like voice, yeah. what a vo- what a very special special voice um and i saw him recently and uh it was a little depressing i'm not gonna lie oh. um you know i mean it, it's hard to keep that up you know with consistent touring and everything um but 
the that first actually i mean for me the first like three queens rank albums are like all pretty much perfection but that first ep is really really special um there's only like two see. vocalists that have actually like aged and held up in my like in my opinion like you know michael kisk from halloween yeah he is incredible it. like uh, incredible i recently saw priest and like like oh i saw him last year yep yeah, and just Halford's like in his seventies, and he's still fucking. Yeah, up. so he like use he's. Don't get me wrong. This is not slander on Rob, not slander on our Lord for sure. Yeah, but he um he does use a little bit of delay and reverb now. Yeah, and he uh, does with some of the choruses. He'll point to the microphone to the crowd, which that's no shade. That is no shade. That dude is in his seventies and he's still doing it. Like amazing. I'm. I will. You'll never hear a complaint from me out of that. Um, but. I think it's a necessity that he's doing and he, at least like at least he's realizing that rather than forcing himself and blowing himself out more but yes when I saw him last year I actually saw him with Queensryche and oh, wow. um it was it was really it was fucking special it was really special um, yeah, I, I saw them last month you are you are right and he has had to look like adapt with his because you know like the voice it changes as you age it's a very physical of course of course and there are maybe other singers that i again i'm probably gonna get heat for this but like i maybe possibly have not seen iron maiden in like a good few years because like he bruce is straining these days he is i i agree i mean i haven't seen them since shit 2015 2014 whatever that book of souls tour was whenever that was i saw them i think i saw them a little bit before that last it was when they were like revisiting seventh son and everything yep 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 Um, and i think uh, i've seen videos of more recent stuff and i agree with you i think it's not as good and he's also kind of getting like weirdly self-righteous too which i don't super appreciate um I um, admittedly like Iron Maiden has never really been my favorite band. Like, yeah, I, I, I dig them, but like, like if they're on and we're like hanging out, having a couple pints or whatever, I'm not going to complain, but I'm never really just going to like put them on by, by, my, by myself, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I also recognize how important they were to, to the genre too. But I, if you're giving me a choice of them, a priest, like I'll pick priest a hundred out of a hundred. Oh yeah, same. Um, weirdly, like Maiden was the band that got me into metal, but I think Judas Priest definitely kind of like supplanted them in my heart. Yep. The, uh... uh, okay. So on that note, the band that got me into metal is just going to be my last song choice anyway. Yeah. Um. So that's perfect. Perfect segue because we're at four now, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The the uh, Queen's Rike was the fourth. Cool. So the last one that i'll mention i mean i could go on about this for hours but the last one i'll mention and it's probably something that people a lot of people know but i don't necessarily think it's something that people really pay attention to is let's do headless cross by black sabbath the tony martin era. yes yes that is a um that whole album really uh and i'm really stoked that they're repressing it finally mm-hmm. um but that whole album is like probably sabbath's darkest work I would say. And I love every era of Sabbath for their own reasons, like from 1970 until Dehumanizer. Like, I love it all. Um, But that particular record is it's 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 a cult. It's heavy. It's poetic. The lyrics are not Aussie lyrics. They're not they're they're a little more um, intellectual, I think um they're a little bit more narrative strong um and don't get me wrong like obviously i love ozzy like ozzy's one of my favorite things ever but um i just think like people aren't really paying attention to how incredible that fucking tony martin era is no like sorry you're like the the first person i've spoken to that's just like like yeah like sorry i i hard agree with this because it's just like even seeing like live footage of him like doing like he can do both the Aussie and Dio stuff justice when they were doing like like live tours. Yep. Like that, 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 yep. that was... Yeah, sorry, just like no, 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 I'm glad you appreciate it because there's yep. most people don't. Um and I I don't even think people like give it a chance because it's not Aussie or Dio. And like I get like the born again stuff. Like I like I get like what what is it? Ian I always forget his Ian name. Gillen, it's yeah. Ian Gillen, thank you. Yeah. Um I get that stuff. Like I like that stuff too, but I get like at least like glazing over that one a little bit more but like that 
like headless cross is a like i i consider that like a must 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 listen and that's another one like if you listen correctly like you'll hear a lot of that sneak into the morgul records too like that's a, that's a very huge album for me and um it's cool to actually talk to somebody that appreciates it as much as I do, because a lot of people don't. <laughs> well, I, I think you probably heard the excitement in my voice when you. Yeah, well, I saw you went like, oh. oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like no, like, like no, like everybody sleeps on that album. Like, it, it really, really, and uh, I mean, Iomi's guitar work on that album is still like it's a plus too. Um, and it, honestly, even the music video for Headless Cross is fucking sick as shit. It's literally just like misty, dark, occult, like it's just it's just everything you want in heavy metal and i just if if i can if people listen to this and i can get one or two extra people to listen to that record then i've done my job because <laughs> I, I, I like i like follow like tony martin on like social media and things like that and it just because it's just always made me sad that he's never quite had that career that maybe like somebody with that voice should should have had yeah i agree i think it was a timing thing mostly um and the fact that he probably followed in the stead of uh two of the greatest metal singers of all time too so true and it's kind of sad that he never got that spotlight but um yeah like uh, i adore that album um, and, um yep. It was really, really weird trajectory, like kind of discovering Sabbath, obviously, then discovering, oh, there was another singer with Dio, this uh, yep. you know, controversial. Yep. This yeah, I love the Dio records, too. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Love them. But that but everybody again, that comes back to the thing. It's like I shouldn't really have to tell you to like listen to Heaven and Hell. I shouldn't have to tell you to listen to volume four, like incredible albums. I would even say borderline perfection. Um, but I, I like, what else can you say about those type of records that hasn't already been said? Well, they're definitive to the genre, like this just... genre defining. Exactly. Yeah. Um, have you, I'll, before I let you go, have you heard, speaking of genre defining, have you listened to the new Savage Oath record yet? I haven't. I ha Oh, don't. No, <laughs> I have. I have. Sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah like, like, sorry. The uh, Brandon Radigan and yeah, yeah. The, yep. The, yep. Uh, the Wings of Vengeance song on it is just. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Like it was like um, I just blanked for a second. But no, like, no, it's yeah. okay. There's a lot of music out there, but um, yeah, amazing. Like we've, I, I like, I have to stop myself playing it every week on the radio. Like, yeah, it's incredible. Um, so like, let, let me leave that as my honorable mention. If you guys haven't fucking listened to Savage Oath, um, that whole record, I particularly like Blood for the King, um, yeah. but uh, if you haven't listened to that entire record, you're really fucking up because that's a uh, a modern genre defining defining record uh it's so powerful and so unique um and so expertly written um that it literally makes me feel shitty about the music that i make. I, mean, I don't need any more encouragement to play savage oath on the radio so. <laughs> <laughs> and like hearing like because it's my first time i've ever heard like brandon radigan do like actual falsetto and stuff like that so oh yeah he's like, incredible yeah, yeah like and just from everything from like you know stone dagger to the stuff he did with uh uh, some Summerlands, like, yeah, and uh, sorry, I just came from work, so my brain's no, it's okay. Bit. How about this one? Uh, I'll uh, have you heard his project that he did, um, called Battle Ruins? No, I okay, I'm gonna link that to you. I, I know we're talking forever, but I'll link that to you on Instagram so you can listen to it. It's fucking incredible, dude. It's um, there's really no one uh, like the, what to call it, but it's called I, I call it like Castle Punk, like I don't know what else to call it. All right, like it's like <laughs> it's like it's like punk rock with like heavy metal solos and vocals about like fucking medieval battles. Like, I don't really know how else to like, and it's him and, and vocals. It was, it, it, it's an older product project. He was way younger when he did it. Yeah. It's one of his first projects, like right when he was leaving the hardcore stuff into like the heavy metal stuff, it was like the bridge between those two. I'm going to link it to you. Just listen to it, and maybe you'll end up playing seven songs for me on this one. <laughs> I don't know, like, absolutely. Um, well, actually, the, the last thing, because um, you mentioned previously like that you have a, a side project with one of the other members uh, called All. Yep. Uh, I was wondering if there is a, a track from that that you'd recommend to introduce people to, because it's I hadn't heard of it either. So. It oh, sure. Yeah, a lot, we didn't really, we didn't really, um, um, we didn't really like push that so much like it was really just like a personal thing i wanted to write a halloween project because i'm i'm a spooky freak but yeah. um it's called orb and uh the e the, the demo it's just a demo but the demo is on Bandcamp, and we have tapes of it and it's called uh the demo itself is called howls in the dark night 
Um, now there's four songs on it. Um, everything ranging from post-punk to like almost a borderline metal song. Um, so I think if I had to pick one, uh, let me see here for a second. I just need a refresh because I need this stuff in front of me. But um, I would say what really is defining the actual um, band uh, because Jimmy put some like weird uh, John Carpenter esque synth over like the punk part of it. Yeah. Um, I would say that either Owls in the Dark Night, the self titled song, or yeah. Scythes of Iron, and uh, they're both super autumnal. Um, they both uh, have heavy synth tones on them, and I would say that like Scythes of Iron is basically about like souls trapped in limbo but instead of instead of um haunting somewhere they're condemned to harvest the internal pumpkin patch so it's like kind of corny stuff like that but like it's fun like th that project was meant to be fun so i would say check those two songs out if you're gonna if you're gonna listen to the entire project no no uh, absolutely um and we're uh, we'll have a we'll have this halloween we'll have a full length coming out with that we will sorry it's okay we will I drink uh, tequila <laughs> we will keep some, uh keep our eye uh, I, I might edit that out but um we'll, <laughs> leave it in dude that's bad <laughs> we'll keep our we'll keep our eyes peeled for that um, um but yeah thank you so much thank you this was this was great man i can't tell you how many podcasts i've done that have been boring as shit this was not boring so great job <laughs> yeah, but thank you <laughs> but yeah um so like just signing off i'm just gonna say Please check out the new Mortal Blade record. It is out on No Remorse Records, and it is Heavy Metal Wraiths, and it does what it says on the tin. Tolkien-inspired, black and heavy metal done expertly well.